And before I begin, I'd first like to thank uh, John Kearney from Kearney's Interiors, who actually took the time to meet with me to not only ver validate the prices I'm going to show you, but also to share his mistakes that he's often seen from people when buying equipment as well. So to begin with, the bottom line benefits of ergonomics, it can result in a three to tenfold improvement in performance throughout uh, throughput and savings if done correctly. Reduce the risk of future occupational injuries and productivity problems. Improve productivity, reduce lost time, absenteeism, and save dollars measured through standard measurement systems. In addition, they can lead to lower WSB premiums and medical costs. Now, uh, to a quote from Hal Hendrick, who is uh, an author and researcher of just about ergonomics. I know of no profession where so small a group of uh, professionals has such a tremendous potential for making such a difference. In light of our potential, why is it then that more organizations with a strong need to obtain employee commitment, reduce expenses, and increase productivity are not banging down our doors for help or creating human factors, ergonomic positions far beyond our capacity to fill them. Now, I, I often joke that when I came on board at OCAL 19 years ago, I sent off resumes across the province. Well, back then, 19 years ago, you said, what do you do? I'm an ergonomist. The response was, ergo what? No one knew what it was. And even today, a large number of corporations do not have an ergonomist on staff. And so as a result, a lot of the responsibilities fall on health and safety members or even the purchasing uh, department or purchasing agent for organization. So how much are you spending? Well, the cost increases by 10 to 100 times each time an injury progresses to the next level. So now we start off with the risk factors. And I'm not going to go into what is office ergonomics because we've done that for 19 years. So. Um, so we have the risk factors, awkward posture, force, repetition. That leads to pain and discomfort. Medical treatment, WSB claim, restricted duties, a lost time injury, and then finally a permanent impairment. So we can get in at the very bottom level of the risk factors. We're going to save ourselves not only a huge amount of money as organizations for cost savings for uh, prevention of injuries, but for the workers for the quality of life. No one wants to be at the red with a permanent injury. I know I've talked about for years people in my office with no quality of life. They've lost their homes, they've lost their wives, they've lost their kids. You know, that's not a way someone wants to live. No one wants to get there. We don't go to work to get hurt. And so as a result, we need to address the issues. And unfortunately, as we're going to learn, what we think we've been doing to address some of these issues is actually going to cause more harm. So uh, objective subjective changes of ergonomic intervention, no, once again, reduces the risk of injury, reduced WCB payments and claims, a reduction in premiums, improved workplace morale, uh, improved workplace relations and worker accountability, and increased, qu increased quality and production. Because if I'm in excruciating pain and I'm sitting there working, how much of my attention is focused on what I'm doing? Probably not a lot. It's focused on the pain level. As a result, making changes, making the worker comfortable, we're going to actually increase productivity because of that fact that they're no longer suffering. So the big fancy definition of ergonomics, the science of studying people at work and designing the working environment to ensure they can be safe, healthy, effective, and comfortable. Another one, uh, fit the job to the worker and not the worker to the job. And of course, my favorite one, one word, adjustability. The ability to adjust the workstation to fit your own individual dimensions. So what are some common mistakes in purchasing equipment? Well, the needs of the worker are not considered. Price over quality, uh, which includes some adjustable features. Choosing looks over comfort, just because something looks nice doesn't mean it is nice. Uh, not all workers are the same, especially between genders. The average male is 5 foot 10 inches. 
the average female is five foot four. Now, just a curiosity, out of the people in the room, who here is less than five foot four? Just put up your hands. But a, a fifth of the, of the population here. Um, when I go into a workplace and actually give a talk in office ergonomics, what I often find is at least half the room are less than five foot four. So designing, going out and buying some equipment, which we're going to learn about, for, that's been designed for the average male, is not going to suit the average female. Um, not testing equipment prior to purchasing it. You don't go out and just buy a car, you take it for a ride. Well, same thing with office equipment. You're going to be spending eight hours a day potentially sitting in a chair. You really should make sure it's comfortable before you buy it. Uh, not having a central purchasing person. I've been in a lot of places where, okay, so Bob needs a new chair. Okay, Bob, go get yourself a chair. Um, no office support. Warranty issues. Is there one? No, a lot of people don't even know that the chairs come with warranties. A lot of chairs come with a 10 to 15 year warranty. But a lot of people don't know that. So the wheel breaks in the chair, out it goes in the garbage instead of just getting a new wheel. That would be covered by the warranty. And of course, not consulting an ergonomist. Most of the most costly mistakes, especially the ones I'm going to be talking about today, were done with purchasing without an ergonomist being contacted first. Whether it's OCAL or an outside consultant. OCAL, we don't, we don't charge for our services. We're pre prepaid through your WSB premiums. But even a consultant would be about $400 to bring in. Well, we, as we learn today, as we go on, that $400 is a drop in the bucket compared to where some of these mistakes can lead to. So we're going to begin with the chair. What are some mistakes? Well, caster material, so caster is actually the wheel, should align with the floor surface. So we want a hard plastic wheel for carpet or a soft rubber wheel for a hard surface. The reason for that is friction. If we have a hard wheel on a hard floor, there's no friction. So I'll be sitting there typing, and next thing you know, I'm way back here, and I'm pulling myself back in again. Same thing with the rubber chair. If you have a rubber wheel on a rubber or a carpet, there's too much. I can't move my chair. So you need to make sure hard floor, soft wheel, soft floor, hard wheel. Now, if you say to your supplier, I need a soft rubber wheel at the time of purchase, it's $15 for the five wheels. However, you now brought in an ergonomist. Oh, we need soft rubber wheels. Well, that's now $25, so it's going up by $10, plus $50 labor. So it's again, $75 increase when you could have only paid another $15 if you had no one up front. Uh, the seat height. Task chairs should have a pneumatic seat height adjustment for comfort and support as well as shock absorption and swiveling range of, mo and of motion height is important. If your seat's too high, as you can see in the red, you're going to get a pressure point right here. That's going to cut off blood flow and nerve supply going into your legs. And as a result, you're going to start getting numbness. And a lot of people will actually say by the end of the day, they're, they get cold when they're sitting in their office. Well, that's because you've actually reduced the blood flow. So make sure your seat, at, seat is at the right height will reduce that pinching. Now, you can get lower cylinders if you know up front what you want. So the standard cylinder height is about normally a five inch cylinder that comes with your chair. You can get that down lower than three inches. It all depends on a number of factors which we're going to talk about. But you can see how they got you know, different ranges happening there depending on the cylinder you need. So once again, if you know what the, that what's, well I'll show the measurement, but what you need for a cylinder, you can actually tell your supplier up front, I need a cylinder that's this high. So for example, uh, <coughs> for a standard chair, you can get a cylinder that's 140 millimeters um, that would give you a minimum height of 17.5 inches to a maximum height of 23 inches. You get one that's 45 millimeters, that will give you a minimum height of 11.5 or 11.6 and 16.9. So quite a range of differences depending on the cylinder you choose. 
However, the seat height varies with the standard cylinder length. So, not only do you have your cylinder lengths, different, different types of chairs come with a different height of base. That's not so weird. Not only do you have your cylinder lengths, different, different types of chairs come with a different height of base. That's not so wheels to where the actual cylinder attaches to. The type of insert of the cylinder. Some inserts or cylinders will insert deeper into the plastic base compared to other ones. And of course, the thickness of the seat. The thicker the seat, the higher your seat's going to be. So as a result, here's a chair or different standard five inch cylinder. However, and then of course, the height ranges. So they vary anywhere from 16 to 21 to 19 to 24, depending on the individual type of chair. So not all chairs, not all cylinders are the same. It depends on the type of chair, the type of company, who you're using, it all varies. Nothing is set in stone. So with seat height, there's no price difference if you order your cylinder up front. After the fact, $75 plus labor to install that lower cylinder. Now also seat depth. Now proper seat depth will allow the root user to sit with the back against the backrest with approximately two, uh, their fist facing up to two fingers facing sideways. They'll give enough clearance so you actually have enough space. What happens though is if your back of your chair is hitting your leg, once again you're cutting off blood flow and nerve supply, but also subconsciously because the back of your leg is being touched, you actually slide forward in your seat. And so as a result, any benefit of a backrest has gone out the window because now you're in that slouching posture. So as a result, the seat pan is probably the most important factor you can buy, look for when buying a chair. Now, I found this surprising because the standard seat pan on a chair is 19 inches. Smaller seat pans are cheaper. So if you say up front, I need a 16 inch seat pan, automatically it's cheaper than the standard chair. Uh, to replace a seat pan is about $150 after the fact, plus labor. But once again, if you did it up front, it's actually cheaper for the smaller seat pan. Oh. Back. There we go. Uh, <coughs> now, depending on the chair, uh, you can, some features of a chair will say, hey, it's depth adjustable. Oh, great, we can get that. We can fit it to adapt to all our staff. Well, no because if the minimum depth of that chair is 19 inches, it's never going to be less than 19 inches. So once again, if I take someone who's 5 foot 4 who needs a 16 inch chair and put them in this 19 inch chair, I can bring it out to 23 inches, but I can't bring it back down any less. So that standard 19 inch chair with the depth adjustable is not going to work for the majority of your workers. Uh, and of course, the cost of that slider it's about $100 uh, to get it. And once again, that depends on the chair and the company. Some companies have that option, some don't. Uh, seat tilt, whether it's a synchronized back or a multi-seat tilt. So when I say multi-seat tilt, that's a one where you kind of lean back and the whole seat moves and the back moves and you're sitting there and you're trying to position yourself and uh, you, who here knows what I'm talking about? I mean, it's a pain to try and get that to set right. Um, so the multi-tilt, which allows us to have the seat, seat back and the seat pan tilt separately, is actually $20 cheaper than the all-in-one unit. Uh, seat angle as well. The seat should not be sliding forward or sliding backwards. Um, if it's leaning forward, you're going to adopt that slouching posture, kind of slide out of your seat. If it's tilted too far backwards, you actually get too much rotation of your hips and can actually start putting strain there and reducing blood flow and uh, nerve supply going into your legs once again. Uh, seat back angle, once again, you want to tilt of anywhere between 90 and 110 degrees. Anything less than 90 is going to put you in that forward leaning position. And if it's too far back, well, I mean, you may as well just get a cot. So, <laughs> As a result, um, having that proper range is very important. 
Now, the type of adjustability for the seat is different. You can have the knob. We actually have a knob that you turn it to bring it up and down. Or the ratchet system that, you know, click, 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 and it locks in place. Uh, and the t once again, it's dictated by the type and chair model. Now, when I copied everything over to black and white for my initial presentation, one thing didn't come out was that, once again, it depends on, I said, the chair model. But traditionally, the knob has been cheaper than the ratchet. And the knob system, or the, well, the turning thing, um, has lasted longer. I've been into a lot of offices where that click, 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 well, it's broken. So I go to lift up someone's lumbar support, kadunk, it falls back down again. Now, I've been reassured that the ratchet system has been improved. It's no longer uh, a cheap plastic system. It's actually metal, so it lasts longer now. But I said traditionally, the knob system was actually cheaper. Uh, you want to make sure you have a lumbar support. So you want, that's why you want that backrest to go up and down. Because you want that lumbar support, that bumpy thing, to fit the smaller of your back. Because that's going to help maintain the natural curve of our spine. Because when I go from a standing to a sitting posture, I actually lose that lumbar curve to my spine. So that lumbar support pushes it back in place. Because going from standing to sitting, studies have shown you actually double the amount of pressure within the discs of your lower back. So keeping that back straight reduces a lot of the pressure within the discs. Armrests. Now this is always one of my favorite ones. A common question, are they needed? Eh, more of an individual preference more than anything. Common misuse. Well, most people, when I go into do an assessment, their armrests are way too high. They're sitting here working like this. So the number one complaint I'll hear from someone, I've got shoulder, shoulder pain. Well, yeah, because you're all tensed up. Uh, another one is the armrests are too high. You can actually compress the nerve, the ulnar nerve at the elbow. So you've all probably heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. But who here has ever heard of cubital tunnel syndrome? Couple. So carpal tunnel syndrome affects your thumb, index, middle, and the inside of your ring finger. That's related to the median nerve. And that impingement happens at the wrist. But cubital tunnel affects your pinky and the outside of your ring finger, and that happens at the elbow. And that's compression of the ulnar nerve. So if your armrests are too high and you're forcing your elbows down on those armrests, you're actually going to be putting pressure on the median nerve. Um, <coughs> so as a result, um, when you're sitting, your arm should actually just glide over the top of the armrests. And a chair without armrest is $135 cheaper than a chair with armrest. And it often comes down to the individual comfort. But I said ideally, with the, with the armrest just below seated elbow height. The other misconception that people do is they'll be typing with their arms on the armrest. Once again, pressure point, and I'm working way out like this. I should actually be working arms right beside my body. The armrests are there to give my arms a rest. Uh, so for example, example, you know, someone walks in my office, I turn away from the computer, I lean back, and I use the armrest. But they shouldn't be used for extended periods of time because of that reduction of blood flow and nerve supply. Now, some companies have actually developed a lower armrest. So the one here, you can see the little bend in it. It depends on, once again, the supplier and the maker of the chair, but automatically, that armrest, and, I mean, I, the height's off of the two pictures, but that armrest is about two inches lower than the standard armrest, automatically. Um, so once again, there's no extra cost if you order the, uh, the lower armrest prior to purchase. After the fact, $125 plus labor. The other option is you can actually take, if the armrests are too high at the lowest setting, you take the armrest off, you put a wooden spacer about an inch thick underneath, and then you go out and get some new, new longer screws and screw everything back in. That's going to drop your armrest down about an inch. Um, once again, labor costs and supplies. Or if you have someone handy at the workplace, they can do a lot of this themselves, too. So <coughs> the average chair, it, it varies. Because some organizations have, especially governments, have pre-approved purchasing plans and all that. But on average, a chair range is about $370. 
So in my case study, I was working with a company that bought 110 new chairs because they changed location. Roughly about just over $40,000. Many of the staff didn't want the new chairs. They liked their old chairs. Um, but we were called in to present an office of ergonomics. Uh, and as we began, staff really started to complain about their situation. Uh, I stopped the presentation. And I went and met with uh, the Health and Safety Committee. And I noted that the chairs didn't seem to fit the majority of staff. So we actually undertook a review of every single employee and every single chair. So I w measured what's called the buttock popliteal length of every worker. And I compared that to the seat pan depth. That difference between those two values will tell me what size seat pan would actually fit that individual person. I measured what's called the popliteal height, so from the floor to the underside of their leg. And I compare that to the seat pan height, floor to the top of the seat. That's going to tell me what height that person's chair should be at. So as a result, if I can't get their chair low enough based on their popliteal height, I'm going to know we need a lower cylinder. And same thing with the other one, I'm going to know that we need a smaller seat pan. So the results? Well, 92% of the staff were available to be measured, so that's pretty good. The seat pan depth was 18.5 inches, so less than the 19 inches. But staff's buttock popliteal length ranged from 17 to 20 inches. Now remember, you want to get a fist to two fingers in that space. So we found, oh, sorry, and uh, yeah, so we found that 60% of the staff, the chairs are too deep for. Two thirds of the staff, the chairs didn't fit. With respect to the seat pan height, the lowest seat height was 19 inches. That's as low as we could get it down. Staff's hub popliteal height ranged from 16 to 20 inches, and we found it, they were too high for 76% of the staff. So three quarters of the staff, the chairs were too high for. Two thirds, they were too deep for. So the company went to their supplier. The supplier was willing to change the seat depth to 18 inches and offered a lower cylinder to, re to reduce the height down to 16.5 inches. However, the seats would still be too deep for 61% of the staff with that 18 inch seat pan. And too high for about 5% of the staff. If the supplier had provided a 17 inch seat pan, all but 20% of the staff would have been accommodated. So to purchase 52 new chairs with the proper seat pans would be an additional $20,000. So the total cost of buying the new chairs and going back and retrofitting them actually came to a total of $61,420. Once again, if they brought in an ergonomist beforehand, what I had done with them after the fact, we could have done and given advice beforehand to make sure they were buying something that would have saved them that $21,000. Or even a private consultant. Remember I said that $400 consult fee can be a drop in the bucket compared to $21,000. So now let's talk about how to adjustable desks. I say that with a very bitter grin on my face, in case anyone noticed. Um, and I'll sh later on in the talk, you'll find out why. Um, but what is the price? Well, it varies uh, greatly based on the supplier. Um, whether it's a, a separate frame or a frame desktop unit combined. Uh, the size, whether you want uh, a bigger desk or a smaller desk. And of course, the features. So I just did a general search. I went on Google. I typed in for a three-legged desk. So that's going to give me that L-shaped workstation. If you remember from past years, I always say you want that L-shaped workstations because Here's my typing area. Here's my writing meeting area. I'm separating my tasks. I want it to be electric. I didn't want to have to sit there and crank a handle. I want to have a memory preset, because I'm lazy, and I don't want to have to remeasure every morning where my desk should be, so I can program it, so I just touch a button, and it goes to where I need it. I want the frame and desktop combined, uh, because I just wanted a whole new desk. And I want the desk to, to be 24 feet, or 24 in, two feet deep, uh, 48 long on one side and 60 long on the other side. Standard desk. So using the above criteria, I found 
that it was about on average $2,600 or $2,600 and with a height range of about 24 to 51 inches. Just the three-legged frame, so no desktop, was $1,200. Uh, the price was very similar for what's called a standard versus extended range. So an extended range would actually go down as low as 22 and a half inches, uh, as high as 48. So 24 was the minimum for one type, and then the extended range was 22 and a half inches. And then of course you can get uh, a single or dual motor. So a single motor uh, burns out a lot faster, doesn't last as long, whereas a dual motor, uh, you have two engines running, so it actually brings it up and less likely for things to break down. Now the interesting thing was, this was all found on a cursory search, so $2,600 on a very quick search. I sp then spent some time, because I know what I'm looking for. I know what I need. But someone without the training, they're going to see the first thing they click on, most likely, and go with that. Or they're going to get three different quotes from three different companies, normally the first three that pop up. Well, I actually found hundred decimal desk meeting my cri search criteria at about half the price, so about $13,000. But that took two and a half hours of searching to find that one. So height range, the standard range of a desk is 24 inches at the lowest, 51 inches at the highest. But you want to make sure you read the fine print. Uh, the height range single base is actually 22.8 to 48.1, not including the thickness of the desk. So that thickness of the work surface will play a role. So if I'm buying just the frame, to go and plunk a desk surface on. Well, if I have a really thick desk surface, well, if that minimum height isn't going to be 24 inches, it's probably going to be 27 inches. So the thickness of, of the surface you're putting on that frame will affect the overall height. Uh, now, you're likely to need a dual stage base. Uh, some suppliers may not sell just the base. Uh, what I'll be giving an example in the case study, their supplier didn't sell just the base, so they had bought workstations, the frame, and the desktop. Well, we had problems, and we'll talk about it, but what we found out was the supplier, nope, can't get just the extended frame, you either have to buy the whole unit again. Um, so you need to be specific to the supplier. More information is better. You want to know the maximum and the minimum height that you need for each worker. Now, of course, there's the alternate type of standing workstations. You don't have to get the electric one going up and down, but everything's got their inherent problems. So this one, due to legalities, I can't say the name of the company or what or anything about it, except it's a unit that sits right on top of my desk. No, it's cost effective, $670 compared to $2,600. It can fit in the small spaces on any work surface. The rest, Awkward postures when lifting from a sit-to-stand station. If you haven't seen one of these, normally you stand like, it's about this wide, so you stand, hold these handles, and you're not lifting up, you're lifting back. Now, of course, a lot of people like having dual monitors, so I'm also doing this with two monitors on top of the workstation. Um, and it's very forceful and heavy to lift, but at the same time, it actually started sliding forward on me, coming towards me, so when I was, playing with one, I actually had to use my leg to brace it so it wasn't going to fall off the desk. Uh, in a, but the problem is, in a seated position, the keyboard is way too high for the average worker. Most desks are too high for most people. So now, I'm throwing this unit plus the keyboard on top of my desk. When I'm sitting, I've now got probably three inches of height now. So if my desk was already six inches too high for me, now it's nine. So this type of desk should only be used, if you have it, as a permanent standing station, unless you're going to cut a couple inches off the, off the legs of your desk. Otherwise, do not use it for sitting, because you will make your situation a lot worse. Uh, so no, the average desk height, 75 centimeters. And I'm sorry for flipping back and forth between inches and centimeters, but some aspects of office equipment, like for example the seat pan of a chair, that's in inches. I can talk about everything else in centimeters. It's the way the market is. Um, but you know, the average male seated elbow height 
So that means for the average male, the 5'10 person, the average desk is 6 centimeters too high for them. So once again, you plunk this unit on top, it's going to be about 9 centimeters too high. Average female, 64.3 centimeters. So the desk is, or the, just the desk itself, it's going to be almost 11 centimeters too high. You throw this other unit on top again, we're probably looking at at least 16 centimeters height difference. That's over a foot. No, half a foot. <laughs> um, so the, you put the unit on the desk, let's say 78 centimeters at the lowest setting, 9.2 centimeters too high for the average male, 13.72 centimeters too high for the average female. Now, of course, there's another type of desk type unit. This one sits on top of your desk again, but it's got a keyboard tray on it. It actually projects below the desk surface. Once again, cost effective, about the same price, $680. Very easy to maneuver, fits in the small spaces, and the keyboard projects below the desk height. However, there's no memory. The keyboard may be too high for shorter individuals. That keyboard projection is only 18 centimeters. And so as a result, depending on the height of your desk, that works to, and, and the height of your chair. So if we have someone set up properly, I've actually seen where these units will not fit that person because due to the height of the chair and the height of their desk, that 18 centimeters isn't enough. And unfortunately, the product doesn't come with a longer arm to be added as an extra feature. So as a result, it won't fit some of the population. So you need to know within the, the height of the desk, the height of the worker, is that range going to work? Otherwise, once again, you've spent $680 that really isn't going to be used. Now, the interesting thing are the additional costs. So anything that's got the red underneath it is what I would recommend for a standing workstation. But then we're going to get into a lot of the other stuff. So any fatigue mat. If I'm standing for prolonged periods of time, I want that cushioning, because no one's carpet in their office has under padding. You may as well be standing on a hard floor. And we've talked about, over the years, about impacts and how just standing and working on a hard floor increases the risk of back pain. So having that anti-fatigue mat is going to give me that cushioning when I'm standing on it. Now, the problem with standing workstations, if I keep it under my desk with my chair, well, my chair is going to get stuck on it. My chair is going to ruin it. So you actually need to move it back and forth to make sure that you're not ruining your mat. So about $70. Footrest. When I'm staying for prolonged periods of time, I want a footrest because I want to put one foot up because that's going to take the weight from my lower back and transfer it to my hips. So it actually increases your comfort range. Monitor arm. If, I, if my monitor itself isn't height adjustable, I can't bring it up and down, I may need to get a monitor arm, whether I'm using dual monitor or single monitor. So a single monitor arm, about 150. Dual monitor arm, about 250. Wrist rest, $20. Mouse rest, about 15. Uh, now this is where we get into the non-critical ones. So these are ones that you know, the supplier will say, hey, we suggest you get these. So memory preset, $90. You know, a lot of people love them. I, I, I do think it's a, a good feature, but it's, is it required? No. So basically, you know, you pro set it where you want it. You program the button for sitting and standing. So I come in the morning, I want to sit. I hit number one. <laughs> now I want to stand, hit number two. It goes back up. CPU holder, $70 for have something to hold your monitor under your desk. Wire management kit, this can range anywhere from 90, whether it's the plastic casing, or up to 180 if it's metal casing. Nope. Uh, half circle desk drawer, got to have a spot to put my paper clips. 65. Uh, the desk wire grommets to keep my wires nicely, nicely tucked in, about $10 each. Uh, do I want to have my desk on wheels so I can move it around? Well, $85 for a set of wheels. Got to have a stand for my laptop. Want to make sure I'm no, not hunched over on my standing desk. How about a $150 stand for my iPad? Got to, got to keep the iPad because, you know, on my breaks, I got to go on Facebook and chat. You know, I can be sarcastic sometimes. 
uh, you know, the two drawer, a two drawer filing cabinet, you know, it's 20 inches high. Two drawer, 20 inches, because that's what you need to get it under a height adjustable desk. Uh, $275. And of course, you know, I have a lot of junk food and stuff, so I, I need two of those. Now, have you ever know, oh, I don't know if anyone's ever noticed, people with two drawer fi filing cabinets, one is just kind of not really used. The other one, top drawer is full of junk food. Bottom one's got, uh, for example, fe with female workers, has the purse. There really isn't a lot of office equipment and supplies in that. So do you need two drawers? Not really. No, one would suffice. Um, so let's look, look at the cost. So for what I highly recommend it, um, if we didn't need the monitor arm, if we had purchased a proper height adjustable monitor up front, the cost I would recommend, about $145. If we needed the monitor arms, depending on the type of, whether it was dual or single, $295 to $395. Now, I want everything. I want it all. Well, just the supplier's recommendations. Ranges, anywhere, depending on the wire management kit, about $1,000 to $1,100. But then we also remember, I've got to buy the desk still. So, the ergo recommended, so, and the supplier suggestion together, adds up to $3,800, or $3,800, almost $4,000 really when you look at it. If you go with the single monitor arm, and ergo recommend it, and the supplier suggestions, we're over $4,000. And then we get the dual monitor arm, ergo recommend it, supplier, almost $4,150. If we don't use the supplier suggestions, 2,800 compared to 30, so $1,000 cheaper. Um, single monitor arm, about a th yeah, everything's about $1,000 cheaper. So there's a huge hidden cost there that you don't realize when you're sitting there clicking those little buttons when you're ordering everything until you get to checkout, and then you're like, holy cow. So a case study, a government office, about 166 new chairs and 166 brand new height adjustable desks. OCAL was to come in to tra help train 10 staff to perform ergonomic measures so the workers could make sure that you know, their minimum and maximum heights where they need it to be. Now, once again, standard desks, the minimum height was 24 and a half inches. Now, I had known that these were coming two years prior. For two years, I did a lot of work with this company. I said, before you buy, you should really have me come back. Two years I said that. So, what did we find? The chairs were too deep for 8% of the staff, too high for 21%, and for 5.4%, they were too deep and too high. So overall, the chairs did not suit about a third of the population. So the cost to fix them, based on the values I gave prior, for the seat pan depth, about $1,900 to fix all 166 chairs. $2,600 for the new cylinders. $1,800 uh, to address the ones that are two, the 5%. Total cost, $6,300 to modify the chairs. Not as costly as the other place. I mean, now the real kicker is, remember I said the desk had a minimum height at 24 and a half inches. Well, it turns out too high for over half the staff. It was, that minimum setting was too high for almost 60% of the working population. If they had purchased a desk with that minimum height, that extended range of 22, all but 1.2% would have been accommodated. If the supplier sold just the frame so they could keep the desktop, it would cost them an additional $133,000 to retrofit those desks. Because if they don't sell it, it was only the whole unit, which is what their supplier only sold, the whole unit again, the top and the bottom, it was going to run them $253,000. I'm free. Hello, you should have brought me in. Um, so now the lower the desks are also not much more expensive up front than the standard. They're $100 more to get the extended range desk compared to the standard desk. 
So if I have just more desks, the only other cost effective process for them basically was to purchase a new keyboard tray. So now you got this hundred or there's no these beautiful high adjustable desks. I mean they were L shaped, they were gorgeous. But now we gotta throw a keyboard tray on them. For hundred for hundred and sixty six well, no. But a hundred people, about another twenty thousand dollars they're paying on top of that. If the correct tray and mechanisms were purchased. Over the years I've talked about different problems with keyboard trays. So this one here it just pulls out. This one, we got those articulating platforms, so the mouse is actually higher than the keyboard. Here's another one. It's the flimsy, tippy, unstable one I've referred to before. No, you want to make sure it comes out, it goes up, it's wide enough for the keyboard and the mouse, minimum width of 65 centimeters to make sure everything can be accommodated. So once again, if they purchase the wrong tray, then probably about $40,000 to go back and fix everything for the tray. So, you know, and also with standing desks, you need to be aware that, you know, the type of actual sliding mechanism may not work. So for, because of the fact that a lot of the uh, high adjustable workstations, you've got the bar, the mechanism, the motor. So the standard pull-out tray isn't going to work. What you need is one that has sit still but has that almost boom action to it in order to fit within that type of mechanism. So once again, if they had just bought a standard tray, not accounting for that metal bar for where the motor is, they'd have to go back and buy new ones again. So te technically, if they bought the flimsy tippy one, they pulled out and had to replace it, we're up now at $60,000. So the total cost of what they were looking for, depending on what they decided to do, chairs, $6,300. If it was just replacing the frames, and another 133,000. Full units, $250,000. Just new keyboard trays, $20,000. So, based on the fact that you, they needed the chairs, cost range, anywhere from $2,700 or $27,000, upwards of $260,000. Nope. So, just a little bit of anthropometric data. Once again, assuming standards, uh, standard desk, minimum height 24 and a half inches. Average male, uh, we'll stick with inches. About 26.3 um, is the average height. So you know, it fits most of the male population. But the shorter, shorter male population, uh, you know, their minimum seated elbow height is 22 inches. So about two and a half uh, inches too high. But the big kicker is the female workers. So the average female seated elbow height is 23.6 inches. So once again, for the average female, 5'4 and less, the desk is about an inch too high for them at the lowest setting. And of course, if we go with shorter people, it could actually be over 4 inches too high. So what can we do? Well. We developed some tools to help you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the author, our office circle calculator and then a bit about our, our purchasing policy that we created. So to begin with, we recently launched this uh, tool back in October. It can be found on our website, um, basically ocal.on.ca slash ergo tools, E-R-G-O tools. It'll take you right to the page, and right in the middle, you'll see Office Circle Calculator. Now, what this requires is you to perform measurements. So you'll see how some have different size arrows. On the actual website, these arrows are constantly moving. So it's showing you the range that you need to measure. So, for example, the first one, seat pan height, the arrow's going to go from the floor to the top of the seat pan. And the same thing with each other body segment that you need. So it's going to look at seat pan height, armrest height, uh, seat pan depth, desk height, screen height, keyboard height, and mouse height. And then it's going to look at the individual worker. So what is their buttock pop -lito length? What's their pop -lito height, their knee height, their elbow height, and their eye height? So all that data gets entered. And then, of course, it has the option, do you use the sit-stand desk? 
So we have to measure the standing eye height and the standing elbow height. So by having the seated elbow height and the standing elbow height, that's going to let us know the range that we're going to need. And of course, it even has an option to, if you wear bifocals. Because we've talked over the years, if someone wears bifocals, that top of the monitor needs to be about an inch lower than seated eye height compared to the average person. So <coughs> just plunk some data in. So what you end up getting is if anything's negative, it's actually good. It means it's, but if it's red, it means it's out of the range of where it should be. Um, and then it gives you your ideal setup and heights for you when you're working. The problem with this tool is it assumes you've got all the necessary equipment up front. So it assumes you've got the high adjustable monitor, assumes you've got the high adjustable keyboard tray. So if you don't, these values, no, you're going to be, well, what the heck do we do now? But if you have the proper equipment, it's very useful to be able to make just a quick checklist to make sure someone's set up properly. Then you can even go back, re-measure, re-run the numbers, and try and get everything right at zero. So how does it help with buying new equipment? Well, the calculator can be used for more than determining whether how it should be adjusted. So let's do a little example. So we're going to do someone who's five feet, you know, way below average. And the, we'll assume the company is looking at new equipment, including a brand new sit-stand desk. So uh, with the calculator, all fields must be filled in to get the information. You can't just put in some fields because it's, you won't get the proper output. So you do have to input every single field. So, Things like uh, screen height from floor is 123 centimeters, keyboard height 76, mouse height because they're on the exact same level, 76, screen height, okay, we just did that one. Um, no, things like the worker's dimensions, you know, what we had measured, put everything in. Uh, standing elbow, one, or I, 141, standing elbow, 95, and we hit calculate. Well. I know right away from personal experience that if I, I've got a screen height that's 53 centimeters too high for me, someone goofed up measuring because it should never be that high. Um, but I mean, it's just an example. So it's just showing you know, the output you would get. But then it's showing, now d w the values you always get from the calculator are in centimeters, it's not in inches. But it shows you're going to need a seat no higher than 15.4 inches. Your seat pan depth should be 16 inches. And that actually accounts for that fist space within the calculation. Screen height, 27.6 centimeters or inches. Uh, your mouse should be about 22 inches. Uh, armrest situated about 21.3 inches. The desk, 21.3. And the keyboard, about 22 inches. If we're standing, the maximum height range of the desk should be 36.2 inches, and the monitor, 55.6. So in this example, or this output, basically the keyboard height, sorry, the desk height is what we need to look at for a standing workstation. What did I say the lowest setting of, a, of an extended range desk was? Anyone remember? The extended range, not the standard. 22.5. Seated elbow, or, or desk height. 21.3, a full inch lower than the lowest setting of the extended range. So the only option, keyboard tray once again, because we can't get that desk lower. 22 and a half inches, or 20, actually 22 inches actually, was the lowest height desk I could find. So for this individual in this example, we would need that keyboard tray. So if you went to a supplier and said, well, I need a high decibel desk that goes down to 21 and a half inches. We can't do that. It doesn't go that low. Well, then you need the keyboard tray. But if the person's seated elbow height had been 23, then that extended range desk would fit them. So it's, this tool can be used for actually selecting equipment. Not only the high decibel desk, but also the chair, because if we go back, I know how deep my chair needs to be, 16 and a half, based on that person's measurements. 
the height of the seat. I need a seat pan height no higher than 15 and a half inches. So as a result, it can be used prior to buying new equipment just by making those measurements of the individual. So as a result, you're able to get the same chair to fit the proper person. Uh, something else we created, and my goal is to take this now and make it much more interactive, but right now it's still on paper, um, was something I designed called the Office Ergonomics Purchasing Policy. Now, it limits the amount of people purchasing. So you don't get that, Peg needs a new desk. Peg, go to this catalog and order or something. It's going to ensure standardization within an organization, that it defines one person to be the purchasing person. So most large companies, I mean, they have a purchasing department. Smaller organizations, not really. But it designates one person. It also it promotes the standardization of equipment. Not the size, the type. So you know, when you go out and do a, a bidding between different companies, you're going to say, we like that chair. Because they're going to bring in four different models and let you try them. Because if they want your business, that's what they should do. Because remember, you, don't, you try before you buy. Anyone that says, nope, you can just go online to our website and our catalog and pick the chair and we'll send it to you. No, you're paying for that chair. They want your business, they're going to give you that chair to try. Because technically, I mean, when you look back at some of those case studies, $40,000 in new chairs, that's a nice chunk of change for a company. But they have to work. Make them work for that money. So, you can say, you've brought in the chair, you've liked it. It comes, oh yeah, we got seat pans from 15 inches up to 19 inches. It goes from a three inch cylinder up to a five inch cylinder. Perfect. That's the chair we're going to buy. Only this chair. But within the policy, remember what we said about the calculator. You need to know for each individual what whether you need the lower cylinder or the smaller seat pan. You need to know that. Uh, now the rationale behind it, staff select equipment from a catalog, as I said, and so you would get a real mismatch of equipment. And this applies not just to chairs, but, uh, and I can say this because I had permission, we did it with Uni Laurentian University a few years ago. Brought in three of them, they did a bidding process, the university selected their supplier, I then work work the supplier. So as a result, monitor arms, desks, chairs, keyboard trays, document holders, all that was standardized through this process through the supplier. So when they went to order it, they were getting the same equipment. Because traditionally at the university, every single department was ordering separate equipment. Um, so the procedure, well the employee obtains the ergo request form. If they want a new chair, they need to provide the following. And there's a spot in the form where they would fill it in. Their buttock popliteal length, of course, someone has to measure them. You can't measure yourself. Uh, seated knee height, uh, seated popliteal height, seated elbow height, seated eye height. Uh, now, if the measurements are not provided at the time of the request, the form will, can be returned to the employee to fill in the appropriate information. Uh, the po po uh, supervisor responsibility, upon receiving the form, Ensure that all required information has been completed by the employee. Authorize or deny the request. And upon authorizing, forward to the purchasing agent for ordering. For purchasing, upon receiving the request, order the requested uh, equipment from a supplier. The I said by a certified ergonomist, but um, no, depending on if it's got the range, your purchasing agent is comfortable making those uh, deals, then you would order the chair and utilize the existing ordering procedure. So you know, just an example, if someone wanted the whole kit and caboodle, they would mark off, I need a headset, I need a monitor arm, I need a uh, new keyboard tray, desk, chair. So that information would need to be filled in on the form prior to purchasing or being, anything being ordered. Now, the calculator can even eliminate some of those steps. Because when you use the office ergonomics calculator, at the end, you get this unique ID. So what happens is, with this ID, if you copy that, you can actually 
take it, email it to purchasing, your supervisor, your health and safety committee, the ergonomist you're working with, and by punching it, cop pasting in that number, I can retrieve that person's information. So then I now know that when, if you say for example, Peg wants to buy a new chair, she sends me her ID. I keep using you because you're in the front row. Um, she sends me the ID. I can call it up. I can verify. Yeah, okay, so your chair needs to be this minimum. Just because a lot of times purchasing, they want someone to verify what they're getting. So as a result, it makes it a bit easier. Now, a little bit of tips. Watch out for the media. 2015, bad news. Sitting's killing you. Sitting's the new smoking. Sitting's still killing you. Is sitting the new smoking? You know, right from the very beginning, I had problems with this. Not only one, because the media ran gung-ho based on one research study that wasn't validated anywhere else. It's a butter versus margarine thing. They just went, they saw what they wanted, and they ran with it. And because of it, how many people here are actually practicing ergonomics? Just, or actually ergonomists? How many of you noticed a huge increase in requests for sit-stand stations over the last three years? It's insane. It's insane, the number of people, because of this, because of the media. Well, guess what? 2018, now standing at work is killing you. <laughs> Last year, my former colleague Chelsea DeRoche presented on the health effects of prolonged standing. Varicose veins, deep vein thrombosis, muscle fatigue, back pain. So here we are three years later, and the media finally cut up to what I said three years ago. You know, your dog is slowly killing you, your chair is. You know what? Not everyone needs a standing workstation. I mean, personally, if someone is in severe low back pain with sitting, I'm going to say get a standing workstation. If someone has doctor's orders, as an ergonomist, it's kind of hard for me to override a doctor. But I mean, the general person who's otherwise healthy, am I going to recommend a 20, no, anywhere from $2,500 to $4,000 feature? If I can get them to fit that desktop unit that goes up and down, I'm going to have a company go with that if it fits that individual, because that's a 2000 anywhere from a two to $3,000 savings. And it's just as good. The key, though, is not to be doing sedentary work. So it says here, your chair is killing you. Why is the chair killing you? Because I'm not getting out of my chair. I'm not going stretching. For every hour, you should be out of your chair walking for five minutes. That's why I always drink a lot of coffee, because I always have to get out of my chair. It's not bad for that. I mean, to have your photocopy or a printer in a separate room, it's getting you out of your chair. It's getting the blood flow and circulation going. Avoiding sedentary work is what you need to be aware of. Also, there's no legislation on the use of the word ergonomics. Now, it's a catchphrase used by designers and companies. You know, the ergonomic snow shovel. Yeah, it does what it's supposed to do, but there's no instructions. So the average person, I'm going to grab it like I do normally instead of up here. But there's so many. If you remember a couple years ago, I did the thing on ergonomics, yes, no, maybe, where we did it like a game show. And we looked at different products, whether they were ergonomic or not. And so many of them weren't, because there's no legislation on the use of the word. No, try before you buy. Consult an ergonomist before purchasing. OCAL is a free service. Even a private consultant fee. As I said, a $400 consultant fee, that's a lot better than almost a $700,000 error. Salespeople are not ergonomists. They're salespeople. They have to sell you what's, what's available. We will tell you what you need, what you should be looking for. Sit, stand, desk, in most cases, don't need a keyboard tray. Um, when looking at high decimal desk, you need to remember the uh, keyboard and mouse as well, because they can be an inch higher. So once again, standard desk. I come in at uh, 21.1 inches, or 24.1 inches, and the desk is 24.5. Got the keyboard on top of it, it's going to be too high. If the uh, seated elbow height of a worker is once again 25.5 inches, and the keyboard sits on the desk, then the desk needs to be 24 and a half. 
No, other hurdles to overcome. How many here knew that the Ontario government in 2007 developed ergonomic guidelines? <coughs> Nobody. These, oh, well, yeah, you did. But. So these are voluntary guidelines that you can follow if you want. Not enforceable. There's no legislation of them. But we'll put all this money into it and make it just because. Well, they were doing them again in 2018. It should be coming out probably around October. Once again, no one in this room, out of 110 people, no one even knew they existed, except for Oak Hill staff and <laughs> other economists. Um, so if it's not le legislated, how many would actually use it? Let's be honest. Put up your hands. If something is not legislated, if you're not forced to use it, are you going to? Be honest. Raise your hand if you're going to. Three. Three out of 110. And thank you for the honesty, by the way. I, mean, I appreciate it. Another one. You know, Melissa mentioned that the uh, CSA came out with a whole new standard. Yeah, they did. No. Health and Safety Associations. We have resources and tools on all our websites, MOL, OCAL, all the other HSAs. We have free resources available. They're there for people to use. You know, we get reporting rates from the Ontario government, Ministry of Labor lots. Injury rates are on the decline. Yeah, we're making progress. Well, guess what? They're only based on accepted WSAB claims. Only the claims are accepted. What were the unaccepted claims? I did a huge study on 350 custodians a couple years ago. 60% of them were in moderate to severe low back pain. Of the 60%, 30% of them had gone to their employer, had gone to their family physician. So 70% of them, in severe to moderate pain, never reported. So that's not just an unaccepted claim, that's an unreported claim. You know, for the uh, government agencies, including OCAL. What about review of products, especially internally? Remember, those two examples I gave you were government, I don't know if I said it, they were both government agencies. They had PEG. She's the, the government ergonomist, basically, for uh, North, Northern Ontario. Oh, two, okay, two. Were you consulted with any of that purchasing? You're right in the same building. No. Uh, what about the government saying, List of approved or endorsed equipment. You know, once again, I talked about that flimsy, tapey keyboard trick. Why is that even out there? Any, any here that's ever used them will tell you, their arms get sore. Even though it's only about an inch difference, they're slouching leaning to the side. That adds up over the course of the day. Why are they still allowed to be sold in Ontario stores? Why isn't the government doing something? Why is there no approved policy procedure for actually selecting equipment or allowing equipment to be used. <laughs> research. Many research projects dupli duplicate each other. I did a search for carpal tunnel syndrome and hypothyroidism, a known and non-work-related risk factor. 17,000 hits came up. Well, how many times do you need to prove the same thing? Let's be redundant. Most research projects lack any real-world application. And this is where Caleb is going to talk about a very interesting organization that he works with after I'm done. But once again, research. Why not review products? No, do they do what they say? No, what is the difference, the strain of the shoulder with this lower mouse platform compared to the desktop? And do the unit products actually do what they say? There's some good research there. No, uh, no I'm not running. I'm probably over time, so I don't want to go into that. No, the Association of Canadian Economists, the group I belong to. Why don't we review products? Why don't we determine, is this a worthwhile product to spend your money on? And I talked about, you no, know, delay of assessments. So, you know, we get an ergo request. Many workplaces require a worker to come in with a doctor's note before they'll get an ergonomist in. Well, by the time, remember that whole upside down pyramid? By the time the worker seeks medical attention, their condition may be irreversible. Same with the worker. You need to report your problems to go to health and safety. Because working through the pain and hopes it gets better won't unless you address the cause. So 
Next year is the 20th year of our RSI day. What have you accomplished? All right. No, are we still arguing 20 years later for ergonomic legislation? On a plus, MSDs are more widely understood. I said very seldom now do I get ergo what? That's changed. We've increased the knowledge. Equipment design has improved. When I first started, you couldn't get a chair in a smaller CPN size. You couldn't get a smaller cylinder. Changes are happening within industries. But the bottom line is, Ontario is one of the few provinces, if not the only province, that has no ergonomic legislation. We only fit in it under the general duty clause. That's it. So, once again, the government, they brought in guidelines, but that's not legislation. It's not enforceable. We can recommend someone to try it, but I don't think you can write someone up and say you must follow the guidelines. No? So what can we do going forward? Ask yourself that. What can we do? It's great to come together. It's great to work with my colleagues from the other OCAL clinics. I love it. It's great to see everybody year after year. But we've got to do something more. Thank you.